Researchers in the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute's Network System Science and Advanced Computing Division have been building scenario-based models for the last two decades, providing critical information to decision makers at the state and federal levels. Since January of 2020, they have focused their efforts on modeling COVID-19 and participated in a variety of independent and collaborative efforts to provide policymakers with up-to-date counterfactual analysis of the coronavirus. Their work with the COVID-19 Scenario Modeling Hub was highlighted in the May 5th edition of the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. On this special edition of COVID Chasers, we want to offer you some insight into this team and provide additional depth to our decades-long work in scenario-based modeling. You've met all of these researchers on past episodes, and we hope you enjoy this opportunity to dig a little deeper into this critical work. Now let's go talk to the COVID chasers. Marav and Steven, when did you guys really get started in this scenario modeling? When did you, when did you know that this was going to become a thing that we should do? You know, Erin, we actually have been doing scenario-based modeling the first time we started doing epidemiology. You know, this is just the way we have always done epidemiology. In fact, it's fair to say we were, and Stephen will elaborate, we were quite hesitant to do forecasting for a long, long time and stayed out of it. We have now become part of it because we realize there is a huge interest in forecasting. But from the very beginning, the first study that Stephen led with the Office of Homeland Security that General Lawler had requested as a part of our work for what's called NISAC then, on smallpox release was a straight up scenario study and a four cell experimental design. And we studied, you know, how vaccines and other social distancing measures could be useful. We continued with it in the 2005 outbreak. In again, uh, Richard Hatchett, who was in the White House and requested the study. This was a nice study, just like the MMWR. This came out in PNAS as a report that again, Stephen and Brian played a central role, all of us have them. There's an IOM report as well, as a technical report with all of us as a part of it, but as a paper written between the three groups. And then 2009, and then the Ebola and the other subsequent ones. But that's really how we have done it. In fact, every data request that we get is essentially a scenario analysis. They'll tell us, tell us what would happen if, and then that's how we do the work. So Stephen, you know, Madhav has mentioned scenario-based for modeling and forecasting, right? It, is there a difference in the two fundamentally or, or in the way we refer to them? There's a difference in how we think about them, I'd say. So in order to, to understand the consequences of actions you might take in a specific scenario, you have to forecast what's going to happen if you take those actions. Right. So in that sense, it's forecasting. But in another sense, the emphasis isn't on the absolute number of casualties, for example, or, or the absolute morbidity and mortality. It's on the difference between what would happen if you took this course of action versus that course of action. Moreover, it's not even always just about that difference. So if you put yourself in the position of a policymaker, they may be between a rock and a hard place, and they might know this, but there's no good decision they can make. Right. So they're going to take some sort of action, and things are going to look pretty bad. You know, there may be 100,000 deaths in a pandemic. Right. So they need some way to understand whether things would have been worse if they'd taken another choice. So in that sense, it's, it's not just the forecast. It's, it's really this context of different scenarios, different things. How do different scenarios play out? And uh, the models are really the only way to tell because you know, we've got an N of one, we've got one world, there's, there's no planet B. And uh, right. if, if you take a, an action that's mutually exclusive with some other action, you'll never know what might've happened if you'd done that. So that's why we build models. And that's why it's, it's important to be able to put some confidence in the results of the model. To, to let you explain why you took an action that you took. And I think the general public, when they hear forecast, they think weather, yeah. right? And 
and there's a certain amount of accuracy or not accuracy in the weather, but it's not dependent on what I do, right? It's, it's dependent on what the weather patterns and the wind and all of that is doing. But I think that's really a difference that the average person doesn't get with these kind of epidemiological forecasting. I, I really like scenario-based models actually much better than forecasting as a lay person. That makes much more sense to me. Right. I mean, actually you bring up a very good analogy here in, uh, in continuing on what Stephen said. So other term for scenario-based modeling is what if analysis. Some people also call it counterfactual. Okay. Right. Counterfactual because you're just saying what happens if these are not facts that are playing out. But you make a good point. In weather, the weather, tomorrow's temperature is going to be some number, right. regardless of whatever happens, right? At least so far, we have not been able to change that. Or it is going to rain or not rain. It's just a question of our ability to pick it up correctly. But in scenario-based modeling, every socio-technical system, our actions are going to be a part of it. And the scenarios, that's why are built to show the effects of our interventions. You can, of course, talk about interventions at the scale of climate, you know, whether we reduce our greenhouse gas effects, and that would reduce Earth's temperature a little bit or not. And so there is actually exactly the same discussion that is going on in climate change debate, because there are the scenarios, of course, 100 years, thousand years, you know, long term, right. much longer right. term, but the same basic questions, right? Because we have something to do, our ability to control the outcome is there. In weather, tomorrow's temperature or tomorrow's rain, we have no, no ability to, you know, change the outcome. It's, it is what it is. Right. Or the position of the moon. Uh, so I think your point is, it's a very good analogy that you bring up. Yeah, I, I just add that the discipline of of being constrained to a scenario also helps you really bring out the, uh, the, the assumptions that have gone into the model. Mm -hmm. So some of the assumptions are exactly this feedback loop between what's happening, what, what the situation, how it's unfolding and what people do. And if you, if you don't have to specify that in the scenario, that it's easy just to sweep it all under the rug and say, well, I've got a model, it models people's behavior and their responses and not say what the actual model is. <laughs> but if you've got a scenario that says, you know, these people will become sick and these people will refuse to wear masks and, and this and this and this, then it's all, it's all out there. It's all transparently specified. Right. You know, even, even as Stephen was saying, one thing that occurs is the way the modeler might interpret these large, broad, statements from you know, when you do scenario-based modeling could be different. In fact, in the MMWR, the modeling teams are quite diverse. We use a patch-like model. Alex uses, uh, as I understand, a version of agent-based model. Uh, other groups use SCIR style models. Uh, some people might be using a you know, straight up uh, time series model, I do not know. But certainly there are five different teams using different styles of modeling. So. As Stephen pointed out, even when you specify exactly that I'm going to vaccinate 20% of the folks, its representation with the, within the modeling is actually quite different. And it's valuable for the, for the decision maker to see the range of outcomes because after all these are models, all of them are wrong. Right. So, the, so the decision maker gets to see the range. And I think we need that. Otherwise, we are always biased, no model is, uh, is perfect anyway, at least right now in epidemiology, that's, that cannot be the case. Uh, so I think Stephen makes a really good point here in terms of transparency in the model. But I think the other thing st scenario stuff does, in my opinion, uh, is it allows us to provide a range of interpretations, right? Uh, you know, and um, allows analysts to, to rank order the possibilities. So as Stephen said, you know, we might be able to say, you know, this is what we need to do right now, because based on everything we know and all the possible worlds you've played out, this is the right strategy. Now, it doesn't mean this will be the right strategy 10 days from now, because people are still changing their behavior. It might, of course, change. So pe for people to say, you know, you, you said it wrong, there's something better. Of course it can, because <laughs> the model did not anticipate all the changes people are constantly making. Right. And uh, picking up on something Mara said at first, 
when you put these ensembles together, you really need to have a diversity of models. And if you're focused on having each model represent everything exactly the same way, you don't get that diversity. Right. So the scenario is like building this hypothesis that says, I'm making these assumptions and however you model them, I, d- I don't care how you model them. I just want them modeled in some way that makes sense within your modeling framework. And then we really get some better estimate of the distribution of possible ways that this could play out instead of just everyone having the same model, setting the same parameter values and coming out with this kind of consensus that really isn't any consensus. So replication is a huge issue in science, especially right now. And this lets us focus on, a, uh, I think, a, a better idea of replication is given the same assumptions, do different modeling teams come up with similar outputs or not? Or is there a, a range of possible outcomes? Right. Are they vastly different or are they within some acceptable bounds um, and why? Yeah. There's no single truth, as, as Stephen said. You know, in physics, either the moon is there or not there. And so it's a well-defined statement. Yeah, there's no, no hard truth. So right. and I think reproducibility and replicability, both are important. Uh, and so I think Stephen's previous point of transparency that comes along with this is very good. So the specification of the scenario has to be done that all the teams can have a meaningful interpretation of it. Now, the modeler still has an onus. They can't hack up something and say, this has to be a part of your outcome. There, there is a certain amount of transparency the model will have. So, right. and, you know, during the MMRWR and the PNAS paper, you know, Stephen and Brian were a part of it, Chris and Dick as well. There was a certain amount of back and forth and a genuine debate that made sure the models are at least sensible, right? I mean, you should not have diversity for sake of diversity and have junk models in it too. That I, I don't think makes much sense either, right? right? They have to at least follow some basic norms. They have to be able to right. say something about the right direction because otherwise you get a variance on, on this that is actually misleading too. Just as much as consensus is misleading, a false variance because of very poor assumptions on the models and the quality is a very bad outcome as well. Uh, and you want to avoid both of them in a meaningful way. Sure. I'd say we first got started with scenario-based modeling when we were doing transportation systems. And it was because rather than being in an academic department publishing papers about transportation, we were working with people who had to make decisions about uh, how to design their, their systems, how to make them run more efficiently. And they would come to us with questions in the form of scenarios, what if questions. And that's where we, we really learned to work in that framework. Yeah, so you know, two people who I would say are very influential in this, at least uh, from what I saw, and Stephen should add more, is Chris Barrett, who was the lead of the transportation project, Chris uh, Stephen points out, and Dick Beckman. Because what Dick did, as a good statistician would do, is to take the scenario and we convert it into what's called an experimental design statistic. It's a very formal framework to specify a scenario. It tells you, you know, Different, different variables and their values that you can allow, you know, treatments and factors. So dig, you know, as a statistician would do, converted all this into a very formal study of, of uh, statistical experiments effectively. And then from there on, it became, you know, it became, a, to me, the scenario stuff became close to a science in, in that sense from the work that how Dick put it. And then, if we look at our work, we always design or talk about a full factorial design, a spot design, a space filling design. Sometimes it's just a two by two design. Oftentimes there's not enough time to do. In fact, Dick has done a design if or not if. I mean, Dick has done <laughs> because the data was not there. But the point right. being, he put it on the formal framework uh, using the, the language of statistical science because in some ways, this is how they studied whether to plant uh, on a wheat or potatoes in a field. You know? And that was basically a scenario modeling that statisticians really started off. Sure. I think Dick's training in that and use of computer experiments really prompted him. So he and Chris were very influential in our thinking about this in, along this direction. Yeah. And I think it's important to 
acknowledge how much work goes into designing these scenarios. And I'm sure it's the, the case with the CDC modeling hub, but um, I, I had more experience with the PNS, the targeted layered containment study leading to the PNAS paper. And I can tell you that at the time the models were pretty big and computationally expensive and it could take days or weeks to, to run a few cases. Wow. So we were all worried about how much time it would take to run these experiments. But in the end, I'd say we spent probably three or four times as much time designing the scenarios in mm. like weekly phone calls with everybody involved to decide what made sense, what was realistically achievable, what was uh, cases that we, we really needed to examine. And especially to, to pare it down from being just a huge sensitivity study to really specific scenarios that we could, we could all agree on. And again, we weren't looking at making the models consistent at that point or making the models all represent everything the same way. We were just trying to say, what scenarios are people interested in? Right. To add to that, because I think it will connect very well, this whole style of scenario-based modeling became very elaborate in our work um, with the DOD. Two very big scenarios that I would like to at least highlight in this. Uh, and I'll tell you why I'm saying this, because I brought up the topic of statistical experimental designs. But over time, our scenarios became sequential design and you know, branching designs. It really became very, very interesting because it's a story after all. You know, in a story, things branch, things happen in the, you know, in the forward direction. The current scenario in MWR is relatively simple, uh, just like our previous first few scenarios. But just two examples. In about 2008, nine, uh, Stephen would remember the exact date. Uh, we did a project with the DOD where we studied a putative scenario of uh, of a you know of an event and we studied how the pandemic might spread and in fact in that particular scenario it was a very detailed scenario in which the pathogen starts in new mexico spreads out in a very particular manner uh, and then certain certain sets of events happen okay. and to the extent that we ended up building what we call a storyboarding ability and steven in fact coded one of these you know, software systems from a, you know, starting with a very nice software from MIT. I remember the name, I don't remember the name, but Steven did it. And because that had really very detailed story, it's almost like Tom Clancy writing a novel, right? You know, you have an event, certain things are happening somewhere and something right. is happening because now the scenarios can get very complicated. We did a similar scenario sure. in other project with DOD. So my point simply being that we have taken this idea to a you know, very, very interesting level where very complicated scenarios are being storyboarded out using software systems into branching processes because you, know, you get to a scenario on day 10 and then we see somebody seeing it this way, but somebody doesn't see it this way. We did the same thing during 2001 study for, for NISA. So I, I bring it up because I think as the MMWR work gets more mature, in my opinion, you will start seeing more and more complicated scenarios being played out because once somebody gets a taste of it, they're almost certainly going to ask, you know, how about doing a little bit of this and then a little bit of this. And so very soon right. you need a system to even specify the scenario. So the software that Steven actually was responsible for building had a way to write the story, had a way to represent the decisions of different stakeholders. Many of them were scripted in, others were done by us in the simulation. So it allows us to say, okay, this decision maker actually acted this way, but this particular decision maker's action, we are going to use a simulation to decide. And there are branches that are going on. You could bring up a movie at, the, at that point. So it was a remarkable piece of work that, that played out where the things would spread. You could actually look at it uh, very much like a movie playing out in, in, in this world. I, I think this is a really interesting direction that I think if this is successful in, in that world, it will almost certainly end up going. And I think storyboarding will become an integral part of it. Sure. I think uh, particularly for training, for, uh, for tabletop exercises, this kind of capability is, is just game changing. Too often, it seems as though you, 
invest all this time, all these people coming together to go through a storyboarded exercise that only has one story and it doesn't respond to the decisions that they make. So what are you training them? You're, right. you're not training them what decisions to make. You're, you're training them maybe how to talk to each other about making decisions, but you're not training them what to do in the event of these catastrophes. So this kind of an adaptive thing that you can reach in and change in the middle, it's not trivial at all, especially if the models supporting it are, are very complicated and, and require a lot of computation to, to adapt to. But I think these scenario forecasts are certainly a step in that in the right direction in that response. First of all, I really want to congratulate the team. Amazing work. Um, Brian and Srini led this effort and they need to be complimented for their work that they did to bring the folks together. This is part of a much larger program. I believe five or six teams are involved in this and uh, they all deserve uh, you know, equal credit in some way. And in fact, the team aspect of it is really important uh, in my opinion. Um, I think uh, two points. Uh, first, I think the fact that CDC viewed this to be important enough to be briefed at the highest level for the first time in this form, moving away from forecast is a very, very uh, promising uh, possibility. And I say that because since the time we have started doing pandemic planning, and this is all the way back to 2001, 2002, when we first supported Office of Homeland Security, we always did scenario planning based exercises. We did this for the smallpox effort for bioterrorism. Then Brian and, and Stephen led a study with H5N1 scare that we had for the White House again, uh, uh, that was led by Dr. Richard Hatchett. Uh, again, that was a team effort, was briefed at the IOM meeting. After that, the Ebola outbreak, every time Brian presented during those seven months was of a similar kind too. And finally, uh, Zika and other 2009 effort as well. The point being that this is how we have done our science. So it's, it's, a, it's a really nice culmination of the work these folks have all done. Um, you know, because I think Pure projections mean only so much, but the scenario-based analysis is really the right way to go about it. This is one part of it. Projections do have value for people to prepare. So I think we have perfected a particular strategy. In fact, I would argue that more than 70 presentations that we might have done for the DOD, Brian can correct maybe, more than 70 for sure by now, have all been of this kind. We have done this over and over and over again which is great because I think it tells us that this is becoming mainstream. So again, I want to compliment the team. Brian and Srini have done excellent job for this particular round. And I hope that CDC continues on this direction. So with that, I'll stop. All right, so Brian, do you want to maybe introduce the team members and talk about you know who is here on this core team? Now there's obviously a much larger team that does the work, but this is sort of that the core team on the, the inside of the inside of the inside. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important part to, to bring up. I, we've got uh, Shemek and Joe, Srini and myself, who've really sort of been focused in on the, the particulars of the Scenario Hub work and really done, you know, I guess the heavy lifting. Most of the team members have contributed little pieces here and there, but stitching it all together, making sure that it's done on time. <laughs> Uh, Shemek can attest to the wee hours that one spends alone with their machine, making sure the files are formatted right and committing it into the GitHub repository and answering the emails when they say, hey, this file didn't look right. Oh, yeah, we're sorry. We left something out. There's a lot of those kinds of logistics that um, are really uh, hard and important to get right or else, you know, it just doesn't work. Uh, and so, yeah, this core team has really been uh, the backbone of getting that done. I really want to give a hat tip to Shemek, who carried a lot of water uh, during some of the earlier scenario hub rounds, and even on this last one during his vacation, ostensibly, um, where you know there's so much work going on that it really was um, a labor of love to keep it continued and have, make sure that we had an entry each of the weeks uh, that they were asking for them, making sure that 
all the I's were dotted and all the T's were crossed because that's not um, easy to do. And just to add, I think Anuruddha uh, also played a very important role in com combining a lot of models. Like we have, we have been part of like the, as Madhav hinted at in the beginning, the Scenario Hub is one of these more recent efforts uh, over the past six months or so from late December or something, they started doing uh, on the mainstream, like this projection kind of thing uh, across different scenarios. We've been also participating in this forecast hub, which is a much more longer exercise. I mean, it's been running uh, in the form of flu forecasting for close to a decade now, and uh, it was done for COVID-19. And so we have a set of models that Anuruddha here is like uh, spearheading that part of the team, which is building this ensemble of these uh, statistical models. And uh, what the way we have integrated is also very novel. We'll talk more about it, but Anuruddha is the point of contact which takes something like a forecast and plugs it into our projection model so that we can project for long term. So I think that even that small link highlights how like a lot of effort that happens in the back end comes through into a model. And, uh, and again, like this MMWR paper is like six different teams and we are one of the teams. Uh, there's a lot of exchange of ideas that happened during that time that also helped us improve the models. So you can see how even, even for like CDC, who's looking at this as a modeling exercise, there's nestings uh, of different institutions and then within institutions, sub teams and so on. You have regular meetings with this scenario hub. Um, how do those play out? I mean, do, does that, are the teams all talking and asking questions or... Is it more you're getting information pushed to you? How, how does that work? That sort of evolved, I think, over time. There's been a little bit more in the earlier rounds. There's some more outspoken team members that, uh, that, that did a little bit more of the talking. Um, it's been very interesting in that the coordinating team, which is not completely clear in my mind exactly all the time because the different people come on and off, but mainly headed up by um, Cecile Vabode, Pat Shea, uh, several of their um, students and postdocs, Rebecca did the lead on the MMWR write-up. Um, other people have been doing different analyses uh, for them. And they sort of serve as the background. Mike Runge has sort of been the key facilitator, I guess. He sort of runs the meetings and makes sure that um, if somebody says something that may offend somebody's other modeling assumptions or is critical or something, because it is tricky. We have a lot of different academics who are all really know what they're talking about. And so when one says that you're wrong and my way is right, then we do have some interesting conversations or some debates about uh, the assumptions that different teams are making. So that's that makes for some interesting conversations here and there. Um, and so it's been very nice the way that they've sort of handled that sort of synergy. And I think in the last month or so, there has been a sort of more of a culture developing now that we're a little bit deeper into this. And there's been a little back and forth initially coordinated team was just sort of like do X, Y, and Z, and then you can contribute. And then there's been a little bit more uh, back and forth about different assumptions because they sort of specify, you should have vaccination rate at this, you should have compliance at that. And it's like, well, the data doesn't always support some of these assumptions. And they have sort of gone back and forth, taking suggestions and things. And so that's, that's the basic process, I guess, uh, on those weekly meetings. There's a, lot, a pretty active Slack channel as well. And um, a lot of these teams also contribute during some of the other calls that happen during the week that the CDC uh, hosted. Sure. I don't know if I missed anything. No, I think Brian covered it. I, it's mainly about, uh, and again, the principle of doing these, what they call as multi-model uh, exercises for decision support. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of literature in using multiple models to do these ensembles of forecasts where it's just combine them in some statistical form and say uh, 20 models are pointing this way, but uh, instead of looking at the spaghetti, you can look at this, how this uh, ensemble looks. But when you're combining models, which are more mechanistic in the sense that they, they're trying to capture what's actually happening on the ground and you're trying to uh, encapsulate different assumptions of what the future might look like, then combining them is not that straightforward. And even having this conversation as a team, like you can just, as Brian said, like you can just, throw at them a specification saying all of you go back and model this and come back and submit something we'll just combine them without even asking you it's just a file exchange kind of a thing but right. uh, half the time there is genuine scientific uncertainty that they want to preserve 
And there is, on the other hand, some linguistic uncertainty or semantic uncertainty in how they specify it. So they might put it down and then, as Brian said, one, one team might come and say, we've been looking at that data very carefully, but and I don't think that's the uh, best way to capture this assumption. Maybe why don't we try something like this? And the others also look at it and say, okay, we've been interpreting this sentence as X, but seems like you're doing it as Y. Which, which one did the coordinating team want? Or, and again, more generally, which one do we really want to capture? And uh, that that has actually helped us even understand, like uh, when we talk as modelers, it's almost like we are talking in our own favorite language, but we are all talking about this common problem. And uh, uh, even among, I mean, among a very tight knit team like uh, inside BI or inside uh, our group, we have evolved some of these languages and short keywords. Like we know where to look for. Like if someone says, "Look in COVID comments," they know where that path is even. But right. when you bring a lot of these institutions, evolving that culture and getting these conversations going across people of different levels of familiarity with the subject, you want someone who is just getting into the modeling, but also there's some voice that's uh, like we've been doing for 20, 25 years. And so that healthy exchange happens there. And it's, it was very heartening to view. And I I, I mean, uh, I like Chemek or Joe who have been part of those calls too like how that experience was it's one thing to be part of a team doing this week after week but also listening to how six different modeling teams talk about it maybe yeah i'll pass on the virtual baton to one of them and shamak do you want to start yes sure so my experience with 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 the scenario hub calls is definitely definitely the whole the whole group came together develop the over over Oh, that, that's already I think like five months. So, so it's much easier to to communicate now uh, than it was at the beginning. Like uh, the whole concept, I think was like developed over time, and and it's not only that different groups need to develop like their own ways of communicating and and agreeing on things. It's also like the concept of scenario hub was was evolving uh, during that time, and and that that uh, these discussions like like directly in influence uh, what we need to do. And at the beginning, uh, there was lots of like our internal model adapted rapidly for each round of the of the scenario hub uh, to to match the, the evolving uh, evolving scenarios. Uh, currently, the discussions that are that are uh, going on are more, I think, are more focused on actual data and assumptions than on the on the uh, concept and and, and and scenarios uh, as it was at the beginning. All right. So, Joe, you're a brand new graduate. Basically, oh well, I guess it's been a year now um, yeah. since you graduated, right? Okay. So this is your first job yes. after college. <laughs> wow! I mean, what it's a, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, an amazing first job. So, um, so how do I, I'm interested to to hear your take on all of the things? Yeah, I mean, um, it it has been really interesting. I mean, I I came in. Uh, I studied TS and bio and I did I had a little bit of modeling experience, but nothing really extensive. So, and I started out doing mostly analytics for, for the team. And I've, I've still, that's still been like, you know, the main portion of my work, but on this project and in the scenario hub project, I've been trying to help out with some of the outcome processing, which has been sort of like a, a mini model that's basically incorporating the, the effects of the vaccine to the variant on, on death and hospitalizations. Um, in the age stratified effect of that and and for me this has been really interesting because i've never seen you know the way that this size of a team and across different institutions will kind of come together and work together and problem solve in the session at once like the scenario have meetings where everyone is kind of putting out their uncertainty about how everything is going on and and just the uncertainty inherent in the fact that we're modeling different scenarios and the sometimes crazy spread in the model output um, has been really interesting for me because it's kind of, I don't know, it's very frank. It's a very like honest view of what the science is and what the um, the ideas about the value of this kind of work and um, 
in giving a sense of this is where it could go, but no one really knows exactly what's going on. And um, so for me, it's been a lot of learning just just baseline, you know, like here's coding outside of college. And so I've been learning a lot of, you know, Python right. and working around with, with what, a, what a project is. Um, but then also at a very high level, like how people at, you know, later in their career talk about things that no one knows what's going on. It, it's been really interesting for me to just mostly sit and listen because, I mean, yeah, this is my first job. But, uh, but yeah, it's been really cool um, and I appreciated it a lot. Yeah, I bet it has been interesting to to see the uncertainty of in these folks who have been doing this forever. It really demonstrates science and how we're constantly learning and we're constantly evolving and changing. So yeah, a great, you know, my first job experience for sure. Yes. Yeah, I'm thankful to have the team that I'm with right now. I mean, it's it's been it's been great to be working with these guys. Yeah, in fact, there is uncertainty in what we know and what we don't know, but also there's uncertainty about uh, uh, what what kind of questions do we want to ask. Like there is there's a kind of question of should we? I mean, uh, the MMWR article was a very nice summary of the complex evolution of the scenario hub because initially we were asking vaccination was not something that we were thinking in terms of. I mean, uh, uh, the rates of delivery of vaccines is one thing then how quickly can we get it to the people and then right now we are thinking more in terms of hesitancy and so how do you frame that entire thing and the entire exercise is also to guide public policymakers but also to the way the mmwr was framed it was also to nudge people to go get vaccinated and it's it's something that takes a lot of iterations and in that process you actually reveal as shemek rightly pointed out like the early discussions were about why are we doing this kind of thing? I mean, although every modeling team understands it to some extent, like we want to converge on how we define these scenarios is uh, centrally driven by like, why are we doing this in the first place? Should we define scenarios that are supposed to be the either ends of like the best case, worst case? And what if something weird happens there and we see something that that's out of it? Does it make these scenarios completely invalid? So I think, yeah, it, it's been generally a really nice experience. I, I want to bring in Anirudh into the conversation, mainly because he's been participating in a very similar conversation at like a much larger scale, but a shorter time scale kind of a question because the six month thing for Scenario Hub, uh, whereas for Forecast, the Forecast Hub is like a four week ahead thing, but with 35 different teams, each, I mean, totally 70 models or so. Maybe Anirudh, you can tell us more about like how that conversation happens and yeah, that's a very interesting uh, set of conversations that goes on every Tuesday. We have these meetings where we have 70 participants. And uh, typically, yeah, it starts out with uh, Matt uh, Biggerstaff giving us a briefing on uh, how the forecasts have performed uh, over the past weeks. Uh, so we have multiple forecast targets that happen. Starts with death, the forecasting, hospitalization, and cases. So they, we discuss um, how these forecasts have performed, but uh, all these models get ensembled and then it's called the COVID hub uh, ensemble model and its forecasts are then evaluated. And then we also discuss about some of the data artifacts that has been seen over the past week and that is updated by JHU. And then we go into Nick Reich, who is spearheading this modeling effort of ensemble forecasting and he discusses uh, the the most recent discussions have been mostly about how to evaluate these forecasts. So that has been a major challenge for us over the past uh, 10 months. So there are, there's no clear metric to define how well a model has done. Uh, so if you change the metric, certain models uh, look good. Whereas if you do, if you look at some other metrics, uh, some other models start doing well. And also there's different resolutions uh, at which you can compare these models. So most of these discussions have been around how to evaluate the models. And we are yet to get the right metric or the right set of metrics that can differentiate between multiple models. And um, yeah, and typically when it comes to these valuations, teams have been particularly, they're, they're all putting a lot of effort. So we all want to sort of be on top of the chart. And uh, typically, yeah, so that is one of the hurdles we are, uh, the major like the uh, Nick Reich's group is facing where they don't know uh, how to satisfy uh, all the demands of all the teams. 
so yeah so those that's one of the main discussions then the last segment of these meetings are typically on the modeling efforts like one on one particular team will jump in a week and uh, then discuss their modeling efforts and what they have got right and what they haven't got right and yeah typically these meetings go this way but it's extremely interesting because there's set of uh, epidemiologists then there's set of uh, computer scientists and modeling teams so uh, the, you get a different perspective on this forecasting effort yeah in fact yeah it's it, it's like it's a really nice study in contrast but also like there are common principles that come out because as you listen to other modelers talk about how they are doing it we go back and see are we thinking of it the same way should we reinvestigate our assumptions and that's true for either if you're modeling statistically i mean the irrespective of the model structure that you use uh, uh, there is always that thought process as scientists and modelers we have to go through like we have to be really skeptical of our own assumptions and uh, when when a model does really well we should ask it at the same level of uh, introspection as when it's not doing well and in fact like I, I, brian maybe uh, we can go into some of the nitty gritties of how these different pieces come in and since anirudh was just describing the forecast part uh, we can start talking about how, how how did that i mean i don't know whether any, there are other models that actually bring in this entire notion of like a short term forecast plugged into a projection in fact like this entire training it, it took some time for us to wrap our head, heads around it to see whether it's the right thing to do for us that's an interesting part and that is something that i've probably maybe missed i'm not exactly sure how the other teams are all doing that cuz originally we had been sort of doing calibration judging accuracy based on how well our model was tracking different scenarios and some of the scenarios actually had things that were kind of in the past and so you say well if virginia is operating in a way where we're not wearing a lot of masks and it seems like we're trending on that way then we expect that we would continue in that trend and then we sort of shifted that as the um, as anaruda's efforts and the, the forecasting stuff got more and more mature to we would just say okay well we'll just assume that virginia will trend along the way that it has and follow what the forecast is and then we'll have all those scenarios sort of in the future um and so for a scenario kind of hub kind of thing where you're saying what how will things play out if we do x or we do y uh and again i think shrini you brought up that interesting point of do you show the worst case and the best case or do you show the sort of kind of bad but not the worst and the kind of good but not the best so that you're sort of putting out realistic you know it's not likely the worst case is ever going to happen it's not likely that the best case is ever going to happen it's really probably those medium points in between sort of where we are now in those two things that happen and so to be reasonable or to have a sense of reasonableness about what you're projecting you try and tend towards that and so that was an interesting discussion and so to that end we try and set up our scenarios when we've been doing this for all the various ad hoc things in the past and how we had been pursuing our approach with covid in particular uh, before we sort of synced up with the scenario hub it was sort of chosen along those lines and so it was really useful to have the forecast so that we sort of took a little bit of the weight off of the projections being a forecast on top of what different policy options might be uh so that 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 approach is not something we've done very much in the in, in the past and is i think something um pretty new and a nice a nice complement of the two sort of approaches of like we have forecasts that are based on sort of some statistical analysis some other things baked in there and then we can do mechanistic assumptions about what the future might hold and i think the um the emergence of b117 was a perfect example of that a lot of the forecast models were struggling to sort of incorporate this this increase of this more infectious variant uh and the approach that we sort of had is we could bake that into the projections because we're like well we're at 20% b117 but the way it's gone in all these other countries some of these other states it's going to continue to ramp up we know that about the future so let's put that into our scenario and make sure that that gets included uh and then we sort of flipped it around and try and feed that into the training data uh, after we got a good handle on that so that Anaruda's forecast could even uh, incorporate that information and, and perform a little bit better as well. 
yeah in fact when it comes to something like uh, influenza if you still remember those days uh, when we were doing the flu forecasting every week the data that data that gets updated on friday is corresponding to the previous week ending saturday and then we'll be submitting the forecast the following monday so it's almost like 10 days delayed by the time we submit the forecast and there is there's a lot of research in doing what is called this no casting or hidden casting because by the time you submit your forecast something else has happened in the reality and by the time they look at the forecast and start making decisions, the first week is already happening. Uh, and uh, whereas for COVID, actually, that situation is not there. I mean, in the early part, maybe there were some, but you do get counts of vaccinations or cases till yesterday. But still, the disease process itself has its own delays. So any case that you're seeing tomorrow is not getting infected today. Maybe some of them are, but most of them uh, have gotten infected in the past week. And similarly, the deaths that get reported in a couple of weeks from now, maybe they're getting infected now or the previous week and so on. So there is a natural delay in that process. And that 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 was also one of the underlying philosophies of, can we get some some of that information from the statistical models? Because, because they, they have a good idea of where the trend is and what the next week will look like irrespective of these scenarios. But still, we have to just... A branch of the scenario from this point, but can we at least know what the trend looks like? And that's the thing that we were trying to encode. Uh, if if I, I mean, that's that's how at least for me, uh, I made my peace with like, okay, we can combine this because there is some inherent delay in how we observe it, and therefore the statistical models can still play a, a central role in guiding these projections. Just jumping to Joe, like you d- briefly described about the different analytics that you're doing. And uh, and in fact, like the model itself has evolved into this. The, the core part, which we'll come to with Shemek, there's a lot of computation, but the core part of the SEI model itself is fitting the transmissibility and so on. But there is a lot of these uh, other components that prepare the data and do processing. So maybe you can talk some more about what are the different kind of things that you pull into the model and how you pre-process or post-process them? Yeah, I mean, so that's so like you said, there's a lot of components that go into it. And recently, one of the main focuses for me has been on kind of, uh, like I said, this outcome processing procedure. And so we have these data streams from from the vaccines at the, at the national and the state level. And so previously, I was scraping a lot of that data. And now we actually have, have it scraping the source, which has been really nice. Um, it's a little bit more consistent. And so I do some processing on that to kind of break it up into the age bands and to get a sense of for each state and for each district in Virginia where the vaccines are going in this age stratified breakdown. Um, and then there's also uh, the, the variants that are popping up. And so we've been looking at B117, but then there's other variants like we were talking about this morning, P1, which is, you know, shooting up in some of the states. and. So I've been looking at those and kind of getting a sense, and we've been looking at the literature to try to see, you know, how do those variants change the outcomes and and the transmissibility? And so you guys have baked some of that into the transmissibility in the model, and I've been kind of integrating that into this outcome processing step because it changes the hospitalizations and the death rate from the cases. And so those kinds of those kinds of the data streams I've been incorporating, and then other types of analytics like. Uh, getting a sense of the trajectory of different different states and, and different districts um, in Virginia, kind of where they are in the past 10 weeks and in the, in the trend line for those places in the pandemic. Like, are they surging or are they, you know, growing slowly or are they declining? And I know that I think Anaruta has used some of those analytics to try to kind of bend the performance of the different statistical and mo- uh, different types of models he's been incorporating into his ensemble kind of to, to show how different types of models perform in different kind of phases of the of the pandemic across time. But that's been a lot of the work I've been working on recently. Going forward, uh, the actual process itself is fairly straightforward. The, the calibration of the SEIR model with once all these different things are plugged in, like the variant prevalence, the vaccination data, there's a fitting procedure. But I think that, that hides a lot of things that happen under the under the surface uh, of uh, what we present as the model, because uh, I think Shemek can talk about how much we, the model that we, uh, the name of our model is like UV adaptive and it's been adapting itself almost every other week. And uh, maybe Shemek can talk about all the things that he has built to keep it that way and uh, uh, all the computations that go inside it. Yeah, so 
like our initial attempts were pretty pretty simple and that would what Srini referred to as a core model and uh, we've, we've got that running pretty stable for a while but this epi uh, pandemic situation changes every week basically uh, like we need to we need to adjust some things in the model change the assumptions in the scenarios uh, and we constantly develop new things that build upon the, this, this core model. So once we, because there's more and more data available over time about different aspects like zero prevalence, uh, better, better data about the distribution of uh, infections among, among different populations, etc. Like we are trying to incorporate this data into the model and uh, for me, at, at, at this point, the model ingests this data processed by different people in our group. And there's lots of handshakes and, and the exchanging the, giving the whole process over to, to another person. And this is, this is currently the major, the major effort in, in what I'm doing that to be able to keep up with new data coming in, new analysis, and, and integrate in that into, into the, the model, which currently like we are either like changing some things in the core model or la layering additional, additional things on top of it. If that was constant, we would have like pretty, pretty stable framework, but that changes week over week and keeps us busy. Keeps the cluster busy too, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. MX has been crowned the uh, top Rivana user, I think, a quarter ago. So I don't know if they're going to do new results anytime soon. I, Chen might be rivaling your crown this time. I think he's took it as an affront. So we'll see if he's caught up. I, I'm pretty happy to see that sometimes over the weekend, the, the most of the cluster is underutilized, so I can cram in some extra runs without <laughs> without uh, cutting anyone uh, of the clusters. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, to keep that crown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I, I would add in on that is um, I just really think that the Scenario Hub is a really nice, as you sort of said early on, like a really nice example of how science is supposed to work. Uh, and it really is sort of this combination of sort of people that are technically sound, people who have an idea about, you know, what is useful, what, what, it, what are the questions being asked, um, because a lot of these, both the academics that are running the models are getting asked these questions, but also the coordinating team and then some of the CDC collaborators are, you know, definitely in the loop on like what is of concern, what are people thinking, what are real re reasonable bounds on expectations for things like vaccination. And so it really is a nice example of how science is supposed to work. You have people working, you ask questions, you're frank about what you know, what you don't know, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and that collaboration is sort of produced some pretty good um, stuff, which I think is sort of part of the reason why why it was featured and why people are paying attention to it. I think timing also, luck always sort of plays a role in these things. And so we have the right questions asked and answered at the right time. Uh, and so that always helps. And these are issues that are affecting us in real time. I mean, these this is not some, well, what if this crazy <laughs> thing happened? I mean, this is all of the researchers involved in this are affected personally. Right. I think in the last round, many of us received our second vaccine dose. And so it wasn't just sort of a hypothetical if people can get vaccinated. We were actually physically driving ourselves places so we could get vaccinated right. while we were trying to keep these models running and keep the data aligned and uh, et cetera. So, yeah, a little right. bit of real and life coming into the academic world. Of, yes, that yeah, that line is definitely blurred in this case for sure. Are there any comments about current challenges or challenges going forward? I know 
Shemek, you, you, well, everyone has said these are some of the challenges that we faced, but what do you anticipate in the future as being some of your future challenges? Or we don't even want to go there because that's too scary or, or too random. Under the optimistic and the pessimistic scenarios. Yes, right. Not quite the worst case, not quite the best case. What may be challenging at some point is uh, to incorporate and make valid assumptions about different variants that may that may show up and especially when when uh, there are no firm conclusions about the behavior of the of the given variant that may show up so that that would be a challenging point that will require us to run a lot of hypothetical scenarios to, to at least partially evaluate how how what the future may 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 bring yeah I, yeah that's definitely one of the the technical challenges i think just going forward like we've been doing this for for quite a while and i think as as covid 19 here in the united states hopefully continues on its downward trajectory um figuring out how to transition and keep doing this as needed, but also keep up with other topics, I think is also a challenge that we're all facing. We all are trying to keep up with some of the other work and obligations we've made. Pandemic has definitely interrupted life and all of those kinds of things, but the transition back and forth, I think is gonna be challenging. Hopefully it's something that we can do and that these new variants or some of these other things don't disrupt the progress that we've made. And the key part too is that there's going to be a lot of focus on the international community and a lot of work that really needs to be done to support India and other countries that are really struggling, don't have enough vaccine, aren't as lucky as uh, we've been here in the US. And at this stage of having focused on this for so long, I think we've got a lot to offer. But there is also just uh, the concepts of fatigue and ability to continue to do this work is going to be a challenge as well that we'll be facing. To do it in a meaningful way. Yeah, in fact, even the scenario hub, the, that's the kind of discussion. So in the in immediate short term, we had this MMWR to look forward to. And we, we pushed, I mean, it, that was not the prime goal. We were doing these scenarios for policymakers already. And it gave us something to frame our ideas around and then uh, now the vaccine hesitancy is something that we are all focusing on. Uh, but then, like as Brian said, as you go forward, the, the, uh, coming up with meaningful scenarios round after round is also a lot of a lot of thought has to go into it and see whether even those scenarios are what the policymakers are thinking about. Some some groups are actually modeling school reopening and then uh, vaccine eligibility expanding to adolescents and how that will affect. And those are things that will have. And as, as uh, Shemek pointed out, like. How does the international international situation or the other variants that might come and how how far do you keep going up? like at some point uh, you can keep what if there is a covid 21 what if there is a COVID? i mean is that a scenario worth modeling i don't know and there is a point at which as brian said these efforts are funded to some extent for the coordinating team and so on but a lot of it is pro bono by individual individual modeling groups and uh, efforts like this or the forecast have, have highlighted that is merit in having multiple people do the same thing like in scientific community they've realized it as uh, one way to counter the replication crisis or even like just re re repeating someone else's study or even a negative study all of those have merit in science and so when you have something like this and you're saying six teams should model the same thing then there needs to be some way of funding that because essentially they can't go back and say we need six times the money because we want six people to do the same thing and who decides that magic number like if 20 teams come up and say they want to do it and how do you decide and uh, at some point you don't want it to become like the loudest voice wins or the the one with the most money or one with the most resources can uh, uh, do it more sustained and uh, at that point you 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 want to preserve model diversity uh, you want to preserve the a diversity of ideas and to prevent it becoming groupthink, but also you want to make sure you're uh, at some point the diminishing returns will also kick in. Like 200 models, at some point it's, it's tough to just manage conversations. The main reason why, as Anuruddha highlighted, the forecast of conversations are 
much more targeted at looking at like how the ensemble performs and maybe there is some cluster of models that are doing this some cluster of models doing that why whereas here there is a lot more introspection by individual modelers but also kind of looking into how others describe their model and there's there's six people so six teams so therefore you can actually look at one of the five other models and ask them like why is your model doing this whereas if if it gets to 20 teams it becomes increasingly difficult and so just that logistical challenge of how you do it uh, and as an individual team also like we are not the current coordinating team but like as an individual team how do you contribute meaningfully to that conversation without hogging all the mic time those are things that we are i think we'll face as subsequent rounds happen uh, as a closing thing like i mean how does this fit into all the other things that you're doing like you, i think you briefly mentioned that like this is you uh, madhav also brought this up that this is not the first time we are doing scenarios in fact scenarios we've been constantly saying like scenarios are the best way to talk about it rather than perfect forecast there is no nothing like a perfect forecast and models do this much better than actually forecasting them because you're talking about human systems so maybe you can talk about how this fits into how we have been supporting covid-19 pandemic with the state and federal and also like general program yeah well i mean i think i think that that this is maybe a good um good point to be made in that it does sort of force the issue and broaden the sort of public concept or at least the key decision makers concept of how to use models and i think we get a lot of questions like just forecast it just forecast it just forecast it and it's like well a forecast is going to be wrong and then you're going to be upset that the forecast is wrong because there's actions that occur that change the way that things go and it's we can try but it's really hard to get all those things uh, into these kinds of models and so just knowing what it is doesn't give you as much information as what would happen if i did this versus what would happen if i did that um and again all obviously these policy decisions aren't just binary levers that just automatically steer the trajectory of the disease but it does have an impact and so talking about these models rather than like a weather forecast where it's going to rain so you know to bring your umbrella it tells you what kind of umbrella is going to work against the windiness and the raininess that is likely to be happening and so i think that's a really that's why i'm really excited and proud to be a part of this MMWR thing in that it is a prominent place where we're talking about using models in this particular manner. And I think as that gets naturalized more and more, it, it is going to be a useful complement to forecasts. Short-term forecasts are extremely useful because people can do things like make the order for the tests that they need in the coming couple of weeks. And that's a really important decision to be made, but also for the larger policy type decisions and planning kinds of uh, decisions that need to get made on sort of more of a monthly or quarterly kind of basis. These kinds of projection styles based on different scenarios is also really important. So that's the thing. We've been trying to do it this way for a long time. Maybe it's had a little bit of an impact, maybe not, but I think it's been, um, I'm, I'm excited that this thing finally got its, um, got, got so prominently positioned and so that's that's good good news for the for the modelers i think in that it is an additional use that is sort of the most appropriate way to use these models of life. i think that's actually a really great way to wrap it up thanks so much for joining us yeah thanks guys and thanks for all the hard work over the last months and months and months and this week and probably several weeks into the future at least <laughs> uh last point from my side i want to acknowledge uh, mm -hmm. Srini and Brian one more time, but also all the team members, Chemek, Anuruddha, uh, Joseph, who has really done an amazing job. Um, just like we do all our projects, this is a team-based effort. We have two leads, in this case, in Brian and Srini, and then the whole team uh, helps them out, some little bit more, some little bit less. Uh, in this case, uh, these three folks played a great but there are others who helped, you know, sometimes maybe the background. And I call it out because I think that's how we have done science here. Uh, and I think Brian and, and Srini have done a wonderful job, you know, pulling the team together to answer a really important question. So kudos to them, kudos to the team members, and kudos to really the NSAC uh, division for an amazing piece of work that they have done on this and they continue to do during this COVID response. <laughs>